2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 16, says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We're given two parts here, the inner self and the outer self. The outer self is the part that we see all the time. This is why the text opens up and says, do not lose heart. The reason why I'm told not to lose heart is because I'm staring at something all the time that is wasting away. When you're watching something die before your eyes, it's a little bit depressing. So he says, don't be discouraged because the outer self is wasting away. Now, some of you are way too young to understand what I'm talking about because from zero to 25, nothing looks like it's wasting away. You're getting taller, getting stronger, smarter, better looking, like all the above. And then 25. And from there, it's just not the same. You, you hurt yourself, it takes a little bit longer to heal up. You hit something, doesn't feel like it used to feel. And so you're constantly being reminded now of what is wasting away. But he's telling you, look, flip the script. Because when you see what is wasting away, let it be a reminder, not of what you do see, but what you don't see. Because what you don't see is the inner self that is literally being renewed day by day. So my focus becomes on that which is eternal. And I begin to now diminish how much importance or focus I put on what is the outer self? Why? Because it's wasting away. The inner self is being renewed day by day. And so let's just talk about this idea. We'll talk about the outer self next week. But this week, let's just finish up on the inner self. Because the inner self, the heart, is made up of two components, the spirit and the soul. We discussed at length the spirit last week. We sort of summarized it a little bit like this, that a healthy spirit is one that listens to the Word of God. A healthy spirit is one that listens to the Word of God. Now we're going to talk about the soul. A healthy soul, therefore, is one who follows the Word of God. So we listen to the Word with our spirit. We follow with our soul. Decisions to follow, decisions to do are made in the soul. So this is the place where there is a lot of, uh, a lot of frustration, there's a lot of battle. There's a lot of warring going on here. The Spirit is that beautiful place that just feasts on the Word of God. The Spirit is that place that has been born again. The Spirit is that place where we understand our giftings and our callings. God, when He speaks to us, He speaks to our spirit. The Word of God, we place on our, we hide it in our spirit. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, it says it like this The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's huge importance here of constantly feeding on the word of God so that we can have a healthy spirit. Now on the other side though of the inner self is the soul. And the soul is given the task of either being obedient to that which is spirit or being obedient to that which is flesh. That decision is made here. If we backed up Romans chapter 8 and verse 13... It says, for if we live by the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And so I choose to follow him in this space that we call the soul. And the reason why it's a choice is because the Spirit isn't the only voice that I have to follow. When I say have, I don't mean have to, I mean have the opportunity to. Because there are so many voices that speak to and distract and fill the shelves of the flesh, the soul. So let's, let's look at it like this. 
Let's consider your heart, your inner self, and let's look at it as an aisle in a store. I couldn't get anybody at nine to agree on a store, so we're just going to, it's a store. <laughs> and there's a shelf on one side and a shelf on the other. And the shelf on one side of the aisle is the spirit, and the shelf on the other side of the aisle is the soul. And so the spirit hears the word of God, and the word of God is stored up. It's on these shelves. This is where all that you hear from the word is placed on these shelves of the spirit. But then on the shelves of the soul, we have things that we've heard growing up. We have things that we have learned in school. We have things that we've watched via entertainment. We have things that have affected us just in our day-to-day -day lives, memories. These things are over here. They're all on these shelves. And so it becomes important to us if we are going to live by the Spirit, that we reach over when it's time to make a choice and we choose wisely to follow the Spirit rather than something by the flesh that is over here. Because if we live by the flesh, we what? We die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we what? We live. So it becomes hugely important in the space of the heart for our spirit to affect our soul. Now, as Christians, especially in sort of modern Christianity, we have this conversation of following the Spirit, and we kind of can put that in a lot of different contexts. And if you listen to TV preachers, you know, it's, it's kind of an economic thing. It's like how you, you pick the, you know, which slot to throw. It just sometimes gets a little bit wild. Like, the Spirit told me to do this. Spirit told me to do this. I bought this. I bought this. I made all this. And look at, look what I did. Follow. Okay, I get that. The Spirit can direct you in economic matters, but the first thing that he directs you in is your walk of holiness. So for somebody who's negligent to follow the Word of God and how we should behave, that person isn't following the Spirit of God in matters of economics. Now, they might be succeeding economically, but not because they're following the Spirit of God. One of two things, either they're really, really lucky or they're really, really good at economics. But that has nothing to do with your spiritual walk. The gospel has never used wealth as the barometer of who is spiritual or who's not spiritual. Do we have fruit? The fruit of the Spirit tells me whether or not I'm being led by the Spirit or not. Now, when I'm being led by the Spirit because I'm following the Spirit, I'm demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit, then I will also have opportunity now that I've learned the voice of God that He can speak to me in other areas. But I don't learn to hear the voice of God in business. I learn to hear the voice of God in the gospel. And then when I learn to hear the voice of God in the gospel, then when he speaks to me in other matters, I hear him and know him. Why? Because I've spent time with him. This is huge because not everything that floats up in your heart is the spirit of God. The soul speaks too. I'm, I met a guy um, Wednesday. I, I'd met him before. He came up. He's like, hey, remember me? I'm like, I absolutely remember you. How are you doing? He's like, great. You remember my name? The first name that just came up in me was David. I said, David. He goes, Byron, but close. <laughs> this, this happens all the time to us. The difference is the person or the decision on the other side isn't so quick to say what is and what isn't. And so we can have a lot of false positives where we think we're following the Spirit of God, but in fact, we are not following the Spirit of God. And so we have to make sure that we understand what is spirit and what is being communicated to the soul from the outside. And the only way to know that is through the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, for the word of God is active and living and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. And so it requires the word of God to be heard so that that word can pierce what is soul and what is spirit. And then when it's time to make the decision, I can make the decision by leaning into the spirit and choosing him. But that choice is made over here. Um, the other day, Walt and I and Ab, we were at uh, Curry Mango. We were uh, having some, some butter chicken. The Varkies have got me hooked on butter chicken. I, I'm like a butter chicken guy now. And so here I am, and we're eating butter chicken. I'm just sweating. I don't know how you are when you eat hot stuff, but I just like sweat. And then I get a little bit messy. And quick, quick side note, uh, it's football season, playoffs, wings, messy. 
Um, Ab gets on to me all the time about the way that I eat chicken wings. So I, I just want to do an informal poll. It, this is nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just curious. This is going to help me in my marriage for the next three weeks because it's playoff season. Um, when you're eating wings and they're a little bit messy, you can either wipe or clean up after every wing or just wait until you're done. Okay, so, so, who is a, you know, after every wing I'm going to clean up? Like, like high, real high. All right, who's, uh, no, I'm just going to wait until we're done. Oh, man, okay, this almost looks like a tie. This is crazy, because it was so lopsided at nine. Like, there were just a few people who were clean up after every wing, and everybody else was like, ah, I mean, drippy one, easy at 11. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Did you see that? So for the day, for the day, drippy wins. Absolutely drippy wins. Yeah. All right, back to, the, back to the story and the point. And so we're just like there eating and I'm messy and sweaty. And Walt says something about, or I said something about sleeping. I'm not a good sleeper. And then Walt gives me like these, all these good just benefits of what you should do later night, like to sleep better. And I'm like, wow, how do you know all that? And like he's been listening to Huberman's Lab or something. It was beautiful. And he goes, you know what? I'm sick and tired of knowing all this stuff and doing none of it. <laughs> Isn't that our life with the gospel? We know it. It's all over the shelf. But when it's time to choose it, we choose something else. We follow something else. We neglect the spirit and we look for matters of the flesh, or the world, or the devil. Now let me say what I'm not talking about. What I don't mean is that things that are discovered that are truth, that are maybe discovered by science or discovered by mathematics. I, I hold to a statement that St. Augustine made. He said, all truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. There are things that we just, through discovery, that we find, and it's good wisdom, and it's good to follow. And what I love about it is it will never, ever, ever reject what is the Spirit. So there are things that we learn that are right and they are good, and they're on this shelf over here, but they still have to be judged by the Spirit. They have to be. So whatever I discover, it's only true if it either is affirmed or is not rejected by the word of God. But then there are other things that are absolutely rejected by the word of God that we know we shouldn't hang on to, but we do hang on to. Last week I made a little you know, side joke on the Enneagram. And some people are like, oh, what? Is there something wrong with that? I'll be honest, I, I, didn't really, I didn't really know much about it. I was one of these guys, I grew up when the Myers-Briggs was a big deal. We're talking about personality profiles. So those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, these personality profiles, we like to know who we are, we like to know a lot about ourselves. We take these tests and we're like, I'm a this. And, and by the way, they're hugely, hugely fallible because like they say if you take the same thing within five years, it'll give you a different read. So it's a little bit silly to begin with, but whatever, it's something I enjoyed. But the Enneagram was kind of a new thing. Well, I already know what my personality was, so I didn't think I needed to take the new test, didn't really care. Everybody keeps talking about this. But then, 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 Jackie O'Perry Perry, the other day at Passion, she started fussing about Enneagrams. And then she said something that was kind of like, um, she said, we've raised a generation to be more afraid of the Holy Spirit than Harry Potter. Oh, well, that's a good statement. But in the middle of that, I'm like, because I've made, like, Enneagram jokes, like, four with a six wing or five with a one wing, you pick your spell, like, whatever, and I kind of laugh and people laugh, and that's, that's that. But ignorantly, by the way, ignorantly. So then she says, I'm like, well, what's the big deal? I, I mean, like, it doesn't take two minutes, y'all. It's not like the stuff is hidden. So this shape, we don't know exactly where it came from. There's a lot of ideas it's a cool little shape. But the meaning of the shape, at least the meaning that this dude discovered, was a guy named Oscar who was on a psychedelic trip who while he was there, he meets an archangel who tells him all the meaning of this picture. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was high 
and I saw an angel. I'm not attributing that angel to that which is good. So, that is something that is fighting for our attention that comes from a demonic realm. Not, not just the flesh, we're talking about the devil. And so, I, I now don't joke about the devil anymore, because the devil's not funny. But here's what we have to realize. Your gifts, your callings, they're in the spirit. And the flesh is going to come and lie to you and try and steal your attention so you can't hear what God is telling you over here. And every voice is different in each person's head because we all have different callings and we have different gifts. And so what is over here, think not that the devil over there is not trying to sideline you and pull you out of so you can't accomplish what God has called you to do. So it becomes hugely important that by the word, we recognize the difference. We know what is spirit, and we know what is soul. So if I could just kind of get out of the ethereal part of this and just put it in language through story, I'm going to use uh, King David for us to just kind of see his decision-making process and how he flowed in some of these principles so we can maybe see something that we can apply to our life rather than just having this information. The information's good because we do need to know that we should do something before we learn how to do something. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9 says very clearly that seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That means that what is inside the inner self is being renewed. How is it being renewed? We learned in our opening text, day by day. It's a little at a time. It's not all at once. It's us understanding something today that we apply, that we live in, and then tomorrow or the next week or the next month. All the time we use these 5X or 10X something and make these massive decisions that are just going to change the world and change my life. You know, the only thing that's going to change your life is serving God. That's one. That's it. And then, so once we make that choice, you know, a lot of it's just daily. It's just renewed. I want to take some pressure off some of you that you're just trying to get it all figured out today. You're not going to get it all figured out today. The soul is renewed day by day. It's a process. There's a, a mathematic out there that suggests that if you just get 1% better every day, at the end of the year, you'll be 37 times better than you are today. Uh, 37 times better? Okay, you're not getting the math. 1%? One. Percent? one. If I just get 1% better every day, that is hardly perceptible. But at the end of the year, I'm 37 times better than I was. Okay, okay, have you ever like not seen a five-year-old and you come back a year later and they're six? What do you always say? You got so big. Their mom doesn't say the next morning when they get up, you've gotten so big. It's not until you have to take that dreadful Christmas picture every single year that suddenly parents see how big their kids have gotten. It's the same with your progress. It's day by day. It's 1% at a time being renewed until you get to the end of that year and you're like, man, I'm so much better today than I was a year ago. And you just embrace the process. And so we're going to see this through the life of David. Now, why David? Acts chapter 14 uh, Acts chapter 13 and verse 22 says it like this. When God was looking for a king to rule Israel, he said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Now, a quick sidebar, because maybe this doesn't matter to you. It did matter to me. I, um, I would say often a heart like David a heart like David, but that's not what the text says. It's a man with a heart after God. I don't want a heart like David. God gave me my inner self. He gave me my spirit. He gave me my soul. I, I am content 
in the salvation that he's given me, and I participate in the day-by-day-by-day day by day renewal. What I want to be is a man like David who is after the heart of God. I want to be after God's heart. That means not chasing after, it means reflecting. It is you are reflecting the heart of God. And so we see in the life of David how he reflected the heart of God and therefore did all of God's will. And so let's just sort of walk through this. I'm going to pull in some of the stuff that we talked about last week out of our Thessalonians text where we talked about being respectful of authority, those who were over us. And um, then we talked about this this idea of encouraging the faint-hearted and to um, do good or help the weak, admonish the idle. What was pray without ceasing, rejoice, always give thanks in all circumstances, and then uh, that we would not do evil. And so if I could just kind of use this as a framework for us to just walk through David and his decision making. First thing I want to talk about is this idea of respecting authority. People who have, they communicate to us instruction or they communicate to us the word or prophecy or whatever. People who are over us, if I can use that, that phrase that makes everybody mad. David was very respectful of those who asked him to do something who had the authority to do that. His dad asked him to do things and he did it. The king asked him to do things and he did it. He had the opportunity to disrespect the king, even when the king was wrong, even when the king was doing things that were not good for David. Now, I'm not advocating abuse. I'm not advocating you just putting up with being exploited. That's not what I mean. But here's what I am saying. I am saying we've gotten very comfortable with just being very critical of the boss, of the teacher, of the professor, of parents, of politicians. Like we criticize everything and everybody all the time. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 22, David said it like this, touch not God's anointed and do his prophets no harm. It was just something that he lived by. He lived by a life or lifestyle that was respectful of authority. And it worked for him. It works for all of us. This is why Paul gives us the instruction. Respect and honor is something that should be seen in the house. It should be seen at work. It should be seen on the road. It should be seen in the local church. Uh, Quick one on me, real quick, uh, because anytime you sound like a total hypocrite, you have to call yourself out. Um, (laughs) There's a sign on Lake Hollingsworth that said road closed. It was there forever. Forever. Like weeks months. I never followed it once. Not once. I'd go around it, go in the other lane, go, and I'd just drive. I'd drive around potholes, drive around holes, drive around people. It didn't matter. I, it said road closed, local traffic only. I'm not local traffic only. I don't live in one of those houses off that street, but I drove down that street every single day on the way to work. Every day there, broke the rule. Every day home, broke the rule. Every day. Why? Because I didn't respect the authority of that sign. That sign's not the boss of me. (laughs) Except that sign is the boss of me. It's a shortcoming that I'm refusing to pay attention to. And here's the thing, you end up paying the price. Because it says 55 and you're doing 80, there's a price. It says stop, you don't stop, there's a price. It's red, you look around, who cares? You, You pay the price. And the thing is, when we disrespect authority, we don't always see the price we pay, but I promise you, you're paying one. You are absolutely paying one. That's something that David, he understood in his life. And then let's look at this this next one that I find just fascinating. There's three categories of people here that all sort of look the same. Three categories of people that aren't moving. They're not doing something. The one is faint-hearted, the other is weak, the other is idle. Now he says to the faint-hearted to encourage. To the weak, he says help. But to the idle, he says admonish. We have gotten into a habit of taking everybody who's not doing something and we put them all in the same category. We're missing it. We're neglecting the gospel. When someone is doing nothing who is neither weak nor faint-hearted, they do not need help. They do not need encouragement. They need admonition. It's different. 
Admonition isn't a pat on the back and you're doing great and it's gonna be okay. Admonition is get off your lazy butt and do something. That's an admonition. I'm, I'm sorry, move, do something. <laughs> there will never, ever, ever in society be too many faint-hearted or weak people for us to help. Never. There will, ne there will never be too many. But when we take the idol and we move them over into the weak or faint-hearted category, now we don't have enough to give to the people that we're called to because the people who are just being lazy, we're giving resource to. We're giving encouragement to. We're having conversations with. And the conversation to the faint-hearted encouragement, that's a long conversation. You have people that inside right now, they are broken. They can hardly breathe. They need your time. They need you to sit down and talk with them and encourage them over and over and over and over because there's a faint-heartedness that we need to be aware of and we need to help. And I am tired of not having the time or the energy for the faint heart because of all the idle people who are wanting encouragement. I don't have time for this. Admonition is quick. It's swift. It's get up. Do something. To the faint-hearted, it takes time. To the weak, I need to be able to help them. We see this in the life of David. It's absolutely beautiful. When he became king after Saul, Saul was dead. His family was dead. David said, is there not one person from the house of Saul that I can show God's kindness to. And they said, well, there's, there's one. And it was a son of Jonathan, David's best friend. They said, he's lame in both his feet. And he's over in this town. And David said, you go get him. You go get him right now. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 7, it said that Mephibosheth, that was the young man, it said that he came to Jerusalem and he ate always at the king's table and was lame in both his feet. David knew he had resource to help someone who could not help themselves. We need to be looking for people. We're sometimes like, well, I don't know anybody. Find somebody. Find somebody to show the goodness of God to. Find somebody to show God's kindness to. We need to give encouragement to the faint-hearted. We need to absolutely give help to the weak. But to the idle, we just, we just need to tell them to get busy. I mean, look at, look at David's life. Look at when he found blessing. 1 Samuel chapter 15. David is working. His brothers are in the house with his dad. The prophet comes and says, I'm about to anoint one of your kids to be king. And the dad says, okay, well, here they are. And he went one by one, seven of them. And he said, is this it? Dad said, well, there's one more working out in the field. Seven idle, one's out there getting something done. Let me go get him. Let me just promise you this. The devil torments you when you're doing nothing, but God promotes you when you're doing something. God is looking for people who are getting something done so he can give them more grace, more power, more strength to do more. He what? He will trim you up so you can bear more fruit. But to the idle limb doing nothing, he just cuts it off. God isn't looking for somebody doing nothing. He's looking for somebody doing something. The devil will torment you when you're doing nothing. The devil will torment you when you're idle. He's looking for idle isolated people he's looking for them your soul will be tormented when your body isn't moving move do something we see the same thing we keep keep reading in first samuel same thing in chapter 16 david's out working his dad calls him in he said take this, take this food to your brothers he says okay he goes down, his brothers are down at the battle in the valley. There's a massive giant standing in the valley saying, whose God are you? Bring it. Who can fight me? And David gets there and what does he find? His brother's doing what? Not suiting up for battle. Standing around. It said, he saw them standing by. Why? No strategy, no plan, no trying. At least throw rocks at the guy. Hurl insults at him. Do something. Right. 
And David says what? You're going to let this Philistine mock our God and us? No. No, God gave me strength over the bear. God gave me strength over the lion. While I was out there working, God was promoting me. While I was out there getting something done, God was teaching me. And so now I'm going to show all of you what I'm about to do to this Philistine. See, you have confidence through movement. You have confidence through trying things. You say, what, I failed. Who cares if you failed? I guarantee you, you learn more failing than sitting on the couch. I, pro I promise you. I promise you. And so David went and he defeated the Philistine. But what about when he stopped moving? 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, in the spring of the year, at the time when um, the kings would go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him. But David remained at Jerusalem. Verse 2, it happened. It always happens. It happened. Late in the afternoon. When David arose from his couch and walked out on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Where was he supposed to be? Out at the battle, where all the other kings were. Where was he? On his couch. And then he got up, and he went walking around. Now here's the thing. Even in that, there was a choice to make. Like, you're on the roof. You're not doing anything wrong. You're on the roof. She's bathing. She's not doing anything wrong. She's bathing. You see somebody bathing. You're married. You look away. Right? Like here, this is, this is the decision process of the soul that can sometimes get sideways. Um, married guys, I'm gonna talk to the singles. You guys actually, you probably need to look around. You, you need to look around, you find them attractive, do you not find them attractive? Is that somebody you wanna meet, you don't wanna meet? Whatever, like it's fine. You look, you like, is this, maybe, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> married people, married people. It doesn't matter if they're attractive or not. It, you're walking, you see somebody, hello, you keep walking. You don't need to keep looking and determine, well, is this an attractive person? Is this not? Who, why does it matter to you? You're working out. You see somebody over there. You want to wait on a machine. Somebody's already on it. Look over here. Is, are they? What? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All you need to know is somebody on the machine. Somebody's on the machine and th then look away. Why? Because you don't need to notice if they're beautiful or not. That's a decision that is made in the soul. And guys all the time, I want to punch them in the mouth sometimes. They're like, well, I'm not dead yet. You are dead. You are dead. You died to yourself. We crucify the flesh every single day, day by day. You are dead. You're alive unto him. He took you and he took her and he made you one. And that's the only one who can make you one. And now you have each other. And each other are the only two you need for God to call you one. Amen. That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. But when did David have his issue? When he was idle. When he spent too much time on the couch. We, we were having this conversation in a small group leadership meeting the other day. Um, by the way, quick public service announcement. Small group Sunday, whole lot of stuff out there after church. Make sure you sign up for a small group. Deal? Deal? Absolutely. Okay, so this was just something I was encouraging them from Paul's writing to Timothy. He said, Timothy, you're gifting, you're calling, immerse yourself in it. Give yourself to it. Practice these things. I get so annoyed by people who are like, I need to take a break from ministry. You take a break from ministry what, to, to watch Netflix and, and, and play video games? What do you mean? God's got people out there? Pray for the laborers. The harvest is plenty. Pray for the laborers. They want to come up. I need to take a break. A break? What, like for, for a Sunday? Oh, I was thinking like six weeks. Six weeks! Six weeks! Six weeks to not follow God. Six weeks. People, God has called you to lead. You're not going to lead? 
What, what, what are we? We've lost our minds. All this talk about rest. I need to rest. Jesus rested. He rested for a night. For a night. Idol. You admonish the idol. There, there are some of you, you have got gifts that are falling asleep inside of you. Wake them up and go use them for the glory of God because God wants to use you. God has words through you that will help people. You are gifted. You are called. Now move in that gift. Move in that strength. God wants you to be used. I don't want to encourage you to keep sitting. If you are full of the glory of God, don't sit. I will not encourage you. I will not help you. I'm begging you, get up, use your gift, and help somebody. So so this is what we see. David, though, was idle. And when he was idle, there was a man who came in, admonished him. He told him a parable about a rich man who abused a poor man. And David said, that man should die. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet Nathan said, you are the man. Why have you despised the word of God to do evil? When we choose from the flesh, we despise the word of God in our heart. We despise it. This is not a cutesy little, oh, you know, I just slipped up. No, no, stop despising the word of God. If you love Jesus, follow the word. If you love Jesus, fill yourself with the word and obey it. It's time for Christians to be Christians. It's time. This is the hour, man. Like this is like the sun is coming up and these are good times. It is time for us to be the church that God has called us to be. God said, I found David. Here's what that gives me confidence in. He's looking for me. He's looking for you. He's looking for somebody to use to do something amazing. So the prophet said, you are the man. Why have you despised the word to do what is evil? And then David immediately said in verse 20, he said, I have sinned against the Lord. See, when we're in that place, we need to quit making excuses. We need to quit blaming other people. We need to just receive the admonition and repent before God. Because here's what Paul said, if we would have read further in 2 Corinthians. He said, repentance is our salvation and it leads to no regret. When we're sitting making excuses, we live our days in regret. When we're sitting doing nothing, making excuses, we live our days in the shame of not using what God has given us to use, and it's never going to get better. It's never going to get better. The answer is repentance. David repented, and God forgave him. Now, let's just fly through the rest of these. He said, rejoice always. David wrote the book on rejoicing right? Psalm 118, 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. When you get up with a rejoice, when you get up being considered of the good things that God has done, when I get up on Monday morning, I don't want to get up thinking about the things that didn't happen right on Sunday. I want to wake up remembering immediately what God did good on Sunday. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made, and so I'm going to rejoice. I'm not going to rejoice in the misery. I'm going to rejoice in the goodness of God. I'm rejoicing. If I could just play off that word, it's taking what brought you joy and re. Joyce, I will give him glory. I will give him honor at the beginning of this day because this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. And then he went on. He said, pray without ceasing. Now this one is sometimes hard for us. Um, After this moment with David and Bathsheba, by the way, if you're new to church, Um, that girl that he saw um, bathing, he ended up sleeping with her, then having her husband killed, and then he married her and she had a baby. Um, So that's kind of the story, long and the short of it. The baby was born, the baby was sick, and um, David was distraught. His wife was distraught. And it said in um, verse 20 that he sought the Lord on behalf of the child. That's what we call intercession. When you pray for someone else, you're interceding. Paul said we need to have all kinds of prayer and supplication and intercessions. We should make them for all people. We should always have somebody we're praying for. Always. 
It keeps us not so me-centered and we think about others. And so David was seeking the Lord on behalf of the child. It said that he fasted and he went in and he lay on the floor all night long. His prayer life was intentional. His prayer life was extended. It wasn't just this short little prayer over the food or just a quick prayer for work when you pull in the parking lot or school when you pull in. It was an extended time. And it said he fasted before he did it. Just quick little thing because it irritates the fire out of me every January. Um, I believe in the power of fasting, but I just want to remind you that fasting means you're not eating. Fasting doesn't mean you're not going to Dairy Queen. It doesn't mean that you're not watching Netflix or not watching football. It's talking about you actually depriving yourself of food so that your, your body is miserable. It's shouting at you and you're refusing it, and you're saying, no, you're shutting your mouth. I can watch TV with my mouth closed. That's what the word fast means, a shut mouth. If we're fasting, we're not eating. It matters. Why do I say that? Why do I make a big deal? Because in 2023, we changed the meaning of all the words. It's the same thing today that it was when David fasted. You will feel the same suffering, sacrifice today when you fast that David felt when he fasted. It is a non-generational misery. You don't know what that's like if you're just fasting some luxury that he never even had. You're fasting what he had the opportunity to fast. It's what the word means. So prayer was a big deal. And he finishes praying and or in that prayer, his prayer didn't get answered. And here's the hard part. It's when you go into the next layer, when he said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. People started murmuring in David in his prayer. He said, is the child dead? They said, the child is dead. And in that moment, David got up off the ground, it said, and he washed himself, and he anointed himself and he put on new clothes and then he went to the house of the Lord and he worshiped God. Some of us, we can't move forward because there was a disappointment that we couldn't bring ourselves to worship in the middle of. You're not worshiping because of what happened. God did not bring the calamity to you. You are worshiping no matter what because God is greater than any calamity. And when we worship him no matter what, it is his power and it is his strength that we suddenly tap into. And rather than a soul that becomes dark or becomes bitter or becomes frustrated, we take the light from this side and we shine it over on this side and now the heart is full of the goodness of God. We have health. See, a healthy spirit listens to the word, but a healthy soul follows. When we follow, we rejoice always. We pray without ceasing and we give thanks in every circumstance. We have health in our soul. We have peace. We have joy in the name of Jesus because God moves on our behalf. There was another moment, I want to close with this, where After this, David is now having this miserable experience as a leader. 70,000 people in the the nation died. And at the moment that we see this pestilence stop, David, then he goes to that place and he says, I need to buy this land and I need to to give a sacrifice to God right here. Why? Because God has done good things. The pestilence has stopped. And the man said, David, I'll give you the land. I'll give you the, the, the animals. I'll do whatever. David said, no, no, no. Nope. This is the thing about giving thanks. I want to make sure you catch this. When you give thanks, it costs you something. It means you dig somewhere to find it. It means you give something away. He said, no, no, no. I will not give the Lord God anything that doesn't cost me something. 
That's what giving thanks means. And every single one of us, we have this opportunity in our lives where we just have to muster all and walk up to the place, the altar of God, and say, God, I love you no matter what. God, I serve you no matter what. God, I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise. I just thank you for every good thing that you've ever done for me, for saving me. I thank you for filling me. I thank you for encouraging me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you. And you just worship him in spite of, in any circumstance, worship him in that moment. And that soul, that soul will lift up its head. That soul will begin to smile. Those eyes will begin to open again. That body will get up off the ground. And suddenly, because of the joy that has filled your heart, you will do all that God has called you to do. 